Hello, people. It's your boy, Dre Day Every Day, with my wonderful co-host, Bonbon623. Bon and today, we're here to talk about our top five favorite video game protagonists of all time. And I guess we'll jump right into it. And as a proper gentleman, ladies first. So I don't, my protagonist, a couple of them are kind of not necessarily non-characters, but they don't have that much personality, but they're part of my favorite game. So the first one is okay. Chrono Cross. And the main character of that game is Surge, but he doesn't have a personality necessarily so my favorite character was always kid which is like a sidekick of his like someone that you can have in the party so she's like player two in the game and okay. i always loved her as a kid because i thought she was really pretty and i was i'm always going to gravitate towards the female the character. Cutesy, the cute characters but as an adult and I'm playing the game again, I'm realizing that she's kind of annoying. She's kind of an asshole, but I see that she has a particular goal in mind and absolutely nobody and nothing is going to get in the way of that. Even right. if she's putting everybody else in mortal danger. So then it kind of puts her in a gray area for me because it's like, for nostalgic purposes, I love her because she's a very much a go-getter. She knows what she wants and she's going to get the thing done regardless. But it's kind of like, she jumps first without looking to see what oh, she's jumping. Right. So that she's your number five. Yeah, I guess because I would expect that you're number one to have the story. The closer you get to one, the more the story or the background would come into play, possibly. Mm -hmm. But okay, so cool. Well, my number five is Max Payne from the series of the same name. Now, Max Payne, the games, they're really just standard third-person shooters. So I wouldn't say that Max Payne series is in my cream of the crop game conversation, but it's definitely games that, like, when they come out, I play them. But Max Payne specifically is an interesting guy because in the first game, he comes home and loses his – um. he, he comes in fine – well, it's not even finds it out. It's in the middle of his wife and newborn baby being murdered. There's this drug on the street called Valkyr. And um, these guys say, the thugs say, like, confess to a fallen angel. So anyway, he comes home to this happening. And then after this, of course, this makes him dark. But specifically, getting to Max Payne 3 is where the writing got a little bit it just kind of went off the edge because like by, by the time three comes out, he's a pain pill popping, alcohol drinking drunk that kind of took, he took a job to just to keep the lights on. And uh, it was a protection job for, it was a protection job from, for uh, a rich dude had a young wife, kind of typical story. She ends up getting kidnapped. He's he becomes overly connected to the case because of, you know, not being able to save his wife or whatsoever. So but then it's like just listening to like the way his thoughts come out. He's like super dark, super cynical. And it, it's it's almost like. It's like super dark. It's almost humorous how he looks at the world, like when he picks up the. Uh, when he picks up the pain pills, which is how you heal in the game, he has one quote where he says, the words on the bottle were different, but that didn't matter <laughs> because he's taking them anyway. So, yeah, like he's just like a super dark character that's trying to save this girl, but his mind state is just so jaded and ran into the ground from life. So that's why Max Payne is my number five. <laughs> You gravitate towards a dark character. I mean, <laughs> I can't run from it. <laughs> <laughs> well, my number four is going to be Joker from Persona 5. And he's another one where he's a very yeah. nondescript character where you're playing through him. And any, like, any of his responses or him talking in the game is you choosing an option for him to say something. Okay. So he doesn't ever actually speak during gameplay. You're choosing the option. 
Mm. But, I mean, he's still like, because of that, you kind of get to choose the kind of character that he is, which is cool. And the game itself is absolutely amazing. The story is incredible. And it's talking about modern day Japan and a lot of the social issues that they go through and uh-huh. just how very different their society works than Western society, which was very interesting for me to play because then it gave me led me into looking at other youtube videos where people were breaking down the different cultural aspects because i was like it's just not like that here things would happen so differently and then the choices that they were making or that they were making you have to make were very frustrating to me because as an american that's just not what i would have done i would have moved very differently but i had to be in his shoes so that was really interesting and he's a very like he had to become a patient character for self-preservation because in the beginning he he's just a regular kid walking down the street he's in high school and he sees this lady getting accosted and essayed by this man so naturally he steps in to try to help her because he's like beating on her and stuff and it's getting ready to be a bad thing but the guy ends up suing him for stepping in and it ruins joker's life which immediately I got a headache after that and had to sit down and take, because I was like, ain't no way. But that's how it turns out. So then in the rest of the game, he has to really like act demurely and stuff, because despite the fact that he did the right thing, everybody, all of the adults in his life was like, oh, you're just a troublemaker and you should have minded your business. And he's like, no, when I see something bad happening, somebody has to step in. This can't just be how society is. Okay. So it's it's very it's a very fascinating game in that aspect, and I wish that he was a bit more of like a character. Like during the cutscenes, he would speak, but right. during the game, he never does. It's he never say, okay, so yeah, he, so he has more personality than that first character you meant, mentioned. Right? Yeah. Okay. Sweet. So yeah, it basically sounds like he stood for justice. Like I'm gonna say something, even if nobody else will. Yeah. And so he finds a team of people that feel the same way after they go through their situations and stuff. And so they're just a band of teenagers. They're in high school and they're the ones like making a real impact and difference in the world in their own way may not be the correct way, but it's like somebody has to do something. Do something right. Sweet. That's, I like how that I like I always attach the characters that are they'll go against the this like it's like this is wrong and I'm gonna fight against it. Yeah. But um so my, is that the cat? I don't open the window, it's hot in here. Oh, okay. I thought the cat wanted a cameo. Mm-hmm. But uh <laughs> uh my number four is going to be Kratos from the God of War series. But it's actually I like the Kratos, the younger Kratos from the original series that's set in Greek because his his views are more in line with how I see things. So basically Kratos was um he was basically a he was a soldier, a strong war soldier who pretty much he was he was really good in battle and he won most of the wars that he um he was um involved in, right? To the point to where he ended up going on a war where he was actually overwhelmed. And he ended up praying out to a um not he prayed out to the guy Ares to uh to aid him in battle to to get him out because he seen that he was getting his soldiers slaughtered and he was about to get slaughtered and Ares gave him the strength I can't remember if he gave him the strength too or if Ares struck everybody down whatever the case may be Ares came through and gave Kratos what he needed in that instance but it came at a cost. Because it's like now you've indebted yourself to a god who's power hungry. So Ares started kind of using Kratos as a pawn to do his dirty work. And one thing that he did was he sent Kratos to this village to go slaughter this village. And and I don't know if Kratos has like this blind rage, but he ends up killing his um wife and child himself in this blind rage. And then when he comes out of it, he sees it. And then it's kind of when he snaps out of it and realizes that, you know, Ares has pushed him too far. So he began to pray to the gods to, if they weren't going to, they couldn't bring them back, remove the memories of them from him. 
And he also he also had to wear the ash. Like if, when you see Kratos, you know, he has like that palish chalk looking skin. He's act that's actually the ashes of his wife and child that he wears. It's, that was kind of his punishment. So um the fact that they wouldn't remove the the um that they wouldn't remove the memories. He tried to commit suicide. And I believe it was Athena that saved them. And um before he jumps off, he was like, you know, the guys have failed me. And um he tried to end it. And then when he landed, he wasn't dead. And from that point it was just like Oh, okay, so not gonna remove the memories, not gonna let me kill myself. I'm gonna come kill you and everybody. In so Kratos goes to kill Ares and ends up killing every every single god, titan, being, anything that ever existed in Greek mythology because of that whole ordeal. And I'm like, bro, that's the sweetest revenge story that I have ever <laughs> that I have ever seen ever. But yeah, so. But, you know, like I said, when they brought and that was the reason why the newer God of Wars are set in Norse mythology. There's literally nothing left in Greek, <laughs> in the Greek mythology. Like he would be there by himself. So. But, yeah, I like that sweet, super sweet revenge. <laughs> I mean, it sounds kind of OD, though, because the other gods didn't yeah. do that. Well, so. So so basically, I did kind of generalize it. So like to go specific, he was. No, no, no. It's on. my turn. What happened? It's my turn. We already talked okay. God of War. <laughs> you already talked about my. Excuse me. We did God of War. <laughs> Remember that other video? I know we did it. I don't know if I told you game for game how he did that, but just to, just for context for people that didn't see that in the first game he killed Ares. And then the guys were not happy that a guy was killed. So that's what made it turn into an OD thing. So they didn't like Kratos as a guy. And then it went OD from there. So Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> so number three. So my number three is going to be Sly Cooper from the Sly Cooper series. Is Sly Cooper, he's the, he's the raccoon with the blue. Okay. Because I, I have it on my list. I've never played it. And I was like, I, I, I assumed that that was him. I just wanted to make sure. It's really fun. He's a really cool dude. So he's a thief and he comes from a line of thieves. So his entire family of Coopers, they are all like treasure hunter thieves. Mm -hmm. So they'll go like steal from the rich and then keep from themselves. Mm -hmm. And they have a vault that they keep all of their treasures in. And that's just kind of his thing. It's not it's not like beef or anything. It's not revenge. It's just like this is my job occupation. I'm really good at it and this is what I do. And he has a band of Steve friends um called mm -hmm. Bentley and Bentley's a turtle and I didn't forgot the hippo's name, but there's a hippo too. Oh, okay. And Does they he... were all Go ahead. I was just going to say so well I was just going to ask if he had a personality or if he was just kind of a straight. Well, I'll let you lead into it. They were all, they grew up in an orphanage together because I guess okay. something happened to his parents at some point. So they all grew up in an orphanage together and he told them about their family history and they were like, cool, we have nothing else to do. We'll be thieves with you. So then they be this band of thieves. And then the entire game series is them hitting like mob bosses essentially and like going and stealing their things to add to the vault and it's just like this really fun wacky adventure that you have to sneak your way through it's very much a stealth game you stealth can game, fight. Yeah. and he he can't he has like special moves where he can fight but the goal is to not be detected really oh and okay he has a thing for Carmelita Montoya Fox, which is a cop, and she's always trying to catch him. And she's like, I'll get you, Sly Cooper. And he was like, I love you too, girl. And it's just he, he falls in love with the chase. Yeah, I'm pretty sure like he actually has feelings for her, but not so much to the point where he's gonna let himself get caught. Let get caught right. So like, yeah, it's like he said, the thrill of the chase and all of that. And I think she really like genuinely hates his ass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, per the perfect love story one person completely in love and the other person feels completely the opposite mm -hmm. but the universe just brings them together 
all the time and it's just yeah. a really fun game he's just such an interesting character i love his voice i don't know who the voice actor is but they kind of have like a like a mid to deep smooth type voice so it just makes him sound even cooler cooler okay not as deep as kratos but it's, yeah kratos voice is pretty strong he sounds like a mountain that's speaking <laughs> oh yeah especially the new the newer kratos boy you know yeah. <laughs> but, so my number three is, and i kind of debated on putting him on here because it i don't know if it count it because he comes from a fighting game but none other than Jen Kazama mm -hmm. and the and you know because he's not technically a protagonist you know what I'm saying but I mean in the Tekken lore like the Mishima storyline kind of drives it so he's kind of a protagonist so either way it go Jen Kazama specifically as I've touched on in the previous uh, videos, I like Jen because his life story resembles mine to a degree. You know, growing, growing up in a broken home under this belief and then having his mother pass. But I didn't have my mother pass. She just wasn't in. She wasn't in my. I didn't grow up in the house with my mom. And then learning the machine of fighting style and then having his grandma. I didn't have my grandfather try to kill me, but ended up learning, unlearning the Mishima style and learning tr more traditional martial arts and kind of going his own path. And that's kind of how I am with like moving away from religion and going into symbolism and things of that nature. And um, then having like that devil gene, you know, it, it's just kind of all of the stipulations and things that I've kind of had put on me, I see it metaphorically through him. And it's just, he's just, I, I connect to him just off of the life path type of thing. And I just always connect to things that, that like I recognize or something that I see that's kind of like something within me in parts. But yeah, I think he's the, he's the most like me character that's on my list. Mm hmm before I before we let you go, before we go to two, are any of your characters the most like you in your list? Or none of them are like you. They're just kind of more cutesy, uh, random. No, yeah. I don't think any of them are like I mean, not to say that you aren't cutesy and random, but I'm just... No, <laughs> no they... They don't really share don't, like like your personal yeah like a personality with me. Mm -mm. Gotcha. Sweet. Would you say that Jen is like an anti-hero? Maybe like he's not a bad guy, but he's not necessarily the hero either. Yeah, yeah it, it, like you know, it was like the the Tekken story when we talked about it. It's weird because it's like Jen at one point was kind of the good guy, and his dad was kind of the bad guy, but hey, Hachi was the bad guy, and then now Jin, after he gets past hey, Hachi, and now he's trying to I think the story for Tekken 8 or Tekken 7 he's trying to destroy the world mm -hmm. and then there's this makeshift group that Kazuya runs, and it's like well, you were the bad guy in the other game, so <laughs> it's very Attack on Titan-ish so to speak, like I don't know who was good or He's Everybody kind of, kind of stands Eden a little bit. Who? He's kind of given Eden a little bit. Aaron. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's just everybody's for their own cause. And I guess it's more about the 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 blurry lines as opposed to the black and white stories that have been told, like stories of old. So his name is Aaron in the English version? Yeah, Aaron. Okay. But you know, they say the subtitle it's, version, and they always call him Eden. So that's what I well, always... They say it like they actually, but see, okay, now going into like the, this is kind of a deep thing, but we speak the we speak like English in a dead tongue type of way, so we don't roll our tongues with the K's like and stuff like that. So Eden, Eden is they spell it Aaron. But, you know, if you brought that to America, nobody's going to say Eddie. They're going to say Aaron. <laughs> so his name possibly is Eddie with a D. But who knows? Because pronounce it 
enunciation, words, letters, it's all lost in translation. This is like a 14th generation language. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So number two. All right. So these two, my my two and my one are going to be from the same series. Okay. And so number two is going to be Riku from Kingdom Hearts. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Riku. Yeah. They're, they're not a part of the, are they, is it, are they part of the good guys or the antagonist side? Well, Riku's not bad, but he's not good either. <laughs> oh, is he another side character? He's like the player too. Okay. Um, so the story revolves around Sora where you have to find like your guiding key and light and whatever and he's like he's the light of the story and Riku's kind of like the shadow of the story but what's interesting between them is they're best friends and like those those two are aces like they're each other's boys right but there's a girl in the middle right where they have a third best friend called Kyrie, and she's a complete non-character like she is easily the worst character I've ever seen in a video game so we're not even going to discuss her but she's there and Sora likes her and Riku like Loki kind of likes her too but mm -hmm. she likes Sora and so because of that Riku is kind of like getting pushed out and whatnot and then he's like but Sora's my best friend so I'm like well, I want to be here for him or whatever but they're still like over here cake and mind you they're kids so it's not like really a thing but right. it's like a little like a kitty crush or whatever oh. so, because of this Riku um wants to go exploring and he wants to see what the rest of the world is like because they live on a little island like a tiny little island and they're isolated from everybody and he's like i really wonder what's out there i want to like go explore and see what's going on and sora's like yeah i'll come with you riku and Kyrie's like we'll all go together well so then like the game starts right and then there's a certain amount of power that's calling to riku and he's really interested in that power so he's like well i'm gonna go check that out when it turns out the power is darkness so his heart gets contaminated or whatever and he gets swallowed by the darkness or whatever and he's like Sora come with me we can go explore the world together and whatnot and Sora's like yeah but not like this nah, nah, nah. <laughs> so but Riku has always had Sora's best interest in mind but he sees it from a different perspective mind you he's like a year or two older than Sora but like still a kid okay um so he really wants Sora to have his things and he wants to have his things as well. Mm -hmm. But he's also interested in the power side of things. Right. Um, which I think is fair because if you know that there's a certain amount of like they're called key blades. So think of it like a lightsaber or something, right? And you get like to have a certain amount of power that you get to wield right like you're the holder of a keyblade and like obviously who wouldn't want that like that's super dope like you're that guy at this point you are head nigga so <laughs> riku wants that and so he's like well i'm i'm gonna get that but also like i still want to be friends and stuff right um so he's not a bad guy but his heart is more easily influenced to the oh. So it would be uh, like if someone is more easily to addiction or something. Oh, okay. Like they're not bad, but they're more susceptible to certain things. Right. I get you. Oh. Sweet. My number two, I kind of have to cheat a little bit, but it's my list. So <laughs> it's Big Boss slash Solid Snake from the Metal Gear Solid series. And that's one you put your tattoo for? I actually don't have a Metal Gear tattoo. Oh. Um, I have a video game. I have a Hollow Knight. I have a... The one with the quote? What's that from? Oh, Assassin's Creed. Nothing is true. Everything is committed. Oh. Permitted. Yeah. I thought that was that guy. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no. Nah, his name is Altair. Okay. I like him, but he was only in one Assassin's Creed game, so we really didn't get to explore his character. But, um, but Metal Gear Solid series. Um, Big Boss. Solid Snake. Solid Snake is actually a clone of Big Boss, but he was the good clone. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I guess I would have to default it to Big Boss because the whole thing was Big Boss was a, was a soldier who was so powerful and so dominant. He could go and take down a whole army base by himself. And it was like he was such a good soldier that the government was like, we're going to 
you can't just leave. They they cloned him because they needed his DNA to continue. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And the story of Metal Gear is like literally so convoluted that I, I would get it would depend on which game specifically we're talking about, but in the mainline, well, the Metal Gear Solid entries, Big Boss is the character in Metal Gear Solid 3, and he's the character in, well, I don't want to spoil it, but he's, you're under the impression that you're controlling Big Boss in Metal Gear Solid 5. There's a twist within that. I'm not going to explain that here, but Solid Snake is in Metal Gear Solid 1, Metal Gear Solid 2, and Metal Gear Solid 4. So I'm equally attached to both. You know, and also, what I really like about Big Boss is like that whole CQC thing where it's basically close quarters combat. If he gets close to you enough to where he can put his hands on you, there's nothing you can do with it. And I've debated the nerd community. Um, Batman versus Big Boss. Yeah. In close quarters combat, I don't think Batman can do nothing with Big Boss. I stand on that. And if anybody watching it got that smoke, meet me in the comments with it. <laughs> you know. But yeah, so it's gonna go to number one because I got a okay. I got a whole monologue about this one. Okay, so then we're back to Kingdom Hearts for mine, and this is Sora. So the interesting about their names is Riku means land and Sora means sky in Japanese. Okay. So they're they're like opposites, but they complement. They come right. But they complement each other. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Did Not your cat me. mess up? <laughs> okay. Okay. So Sora, he's he's like the lighthearted one of, and so he wants to help save Riku. So he's running around through the game trying to find Riku because Riku's gone. He's out there. He's somewhere. He's lost. And we're like, okay. So our home gets destroyed. Our little island that we grew up gone. Mm -hmm. So now we're just out in the world and we're like, okay, well, I got to find my best friend, period. And that's it. And so we're running around trying to find him. And then there's people who are like, forget Riku. He's given his heart to the dark. You just got to continue. And he's like, no, that's my dude. And I'm going to find him. I'm going to save him. And then, you know, we're going to get back on track or whatever. And I really respect that about Sora because no matter what's going on, no matter what other obstacles he has to face and other things that he has to suddenly fix, um, it's always going to come back to, but I still need to make sure my man's is good. Right. And it's just, he's like fiercely loyal. And it's not a misplaced loyalty at all because Riku is the same way about Sora. They just have very different values, wants, and desires. But at the end of both of that, it's always still like, I got to make sure my man's is good sort of thing. So they're, they're, uh, they're a relationship. No, but it would have made sense if they were. And it mm -hmm. made more sense than that non-character as Kyrie, which I oh. one day... I will make a video about, but <laughs> okay. I think it's really cool to show like a, like a, a very deep platonic relationship between two male characters, because we don't really have it quite like that here in the West, but in Japan, like skinship, which is like when guys will like, like touch each other, like, like over the shoulder or like hug or whatever. Like, it's very like, how women in the West, like we can hold hands and sit in each other's lap. And right. stuff. Like in Asia, it's not frowned upon like it is here. Right. right. So it's really where interesting. Is it, where is it overseas where the, the greeting is the, the hug and the two kisses? Thanks. Whether it's male or female. Well, yeah, so I know that they're pretty different here because, you know, especially when you come to <laughs> to our communities, like us, the homie, like, you know, we have the friendship distance thing and all that, but like me, as I've gotten older, like, man, I, I, I see a homie, I give him a hug. I'm just kind of breaking away from a lot of that stuff. But I, I do understand what you're speaking to, though. Yeah, and that was my first instance because the game came out when I was young. I think we were in middle school. Um, mm -hmm. So that was my first instance of seeing, like, a male relationship in that capacity. Right. Sweet. That's cool. Well, my number one. Favorite video game character of all time is Samus Aran. Super Metroid. 
the Metroid Prime series. And the person that everybody that doesn't know Metroid calls Metroid. <laughs> <laughs> so Samus Aran, um, a little backstory. She had parents. Um, there's this the 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 main antagonist is called Ridley, which is a pterodactyl. Kills Sam Samus's parents. I can't remember the reasoning why. Um, there's this old race that are like guys. They're called the Chozo. They look like owls. They took Samus in, and they knew that Ridley was a threat to the entire um universe, their universe. So they infused her with like Chozo DNA, and that's why that's where her power suit comes from. You know, it's like a her power suit is kind of like a mind, body, spirit thing. Like it's not necessarily a, it's not like something she puts on. It's like, it's just on when she's in go mode and when she's not in go mode, it's not on. Mm -hmm. They kind of played around with that later in like fusion because they had it surgically removed because of something. I'm still kind of in question about that, but anyway, she, dedicates her life to being like a space bounty hunter because there's this race of people called the um, race of aliens called the space pirates but the the big the the main threat in the universe is the metroids and I don't have a picture of a metroid but there are these if you took a jellyfish and you took the uh if you they're like mushroom like a mushroom without the stem or like a jellyfish, but they will they get on top of your well, in the first game, they seem like they will cover you from head to torso. But then in Metro or Prime, they just cover your head. I don't know. I guess depending on what size they are, but they just get on top of you and they completely drain your energy. And they can they can take your energy and infuse it in something else. Like they're very they're very powerful, but there's this other entity called the X-Parasite that um, it can come into you, it can absorb you, and it can turn into a clone of you, but you have died off. But it mimics your behavior so well that it's almost like the, it's almost like the, you ever seen that movie called The Thing from the 80s? You may not have, you may have. We, I feel like when you made that Re Rosemary's Baby reference, I feel like you watch old movies. I I think I've heard of it. I didn't watch it, but I think I've seen the breakdown of it. Yeah. So basically the thing is an alien parasite that will it takes over the host and kills his host, but it mimics their I behavior. The, the game Among Us is based off of, isn't it? Among Us is kind of like that, but it's like somebody's an imposter. You just gotta figure out who. So one the person that knows that the imposter, they have to act a certain way. Yeah. So in theory, conceptually, the way the game operates, yeah. But um, yeah. So Samus dedicates her life to be a space bounty hunter. And outside of this, when I'm playing the game, like her suit, her power suit upgrade, she's literally like the most OP character that I've ever controlled. I feel like I could take down any boss from any series in any game if I'm controlling Samus. <laughs> From her from her blaster, she has a speed booster run that makes her run fast as Sonic the Hedgehog. She has a um she has a flip jump called the Screw Attack that it's like she turns into like a a ball of lightning when she's flipping and she can endlessly jump. Um, she has a grappling hook to swing. She has X ray vision to where she can see through walls. Like it is, she is literally the biggest badass that I've ever controlled in game in history. And when in Metro Prime just recently, uh, Retro Metro Prime Remaster released, and I got to revisit that. And coming off playing Metroid Dread in twenty twenty one, it just reiterates like this is the baddest bitch on the market. <laughs> like she is just no joke, and she's a silent character. And that that will make her like me too, because like I'm gonna see you. It's not gonna be there when she when she sees you, it's on site. There's no external, there's no monologue, there's nothing. It's like, oh you it's on site. And there was a cool evolution where they made to where 
the fact that she had to have Metroid DNA infused in her infusion to remove the suit that got infected by the, the uh, X parasite that in Metroid Dread, that was this character called Raven Beak that was just kind of pushing her to her limits and it awakened the Metroid DNA in, in mid game. She turns into a Metroid. I literally was standing up in my room like you gotta be fucking kidding me. You mean to tell me as OP as she already was, now she has the Metroid power to drain. So she grabbed like this one machine called an Emmy, grabbed it by his head, by his fake beak, and just drained the energy out of it. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> yeah, like there is literally nobody that can fuck with Samus, period. It is just, it is absolutely ridiculous. I heard you. Yes. <laughs> And uh, uh, but I think we're kind of close to the end. Yeah. But yeah, that's my, that's my top five. But yeah, man, Samus Moran, Big Boss, Jean Kazama, Kratos, and Max Payne. Mm -hmm. Those are my favorite characters in gaming. And what's your quick rundown? One to five. Oh, um, Sora, Riku, Sly, Joker, and Kid. Sweet. <laughs> Anybody watching, you got your favorite characters? Did we leave somebody out that you feel like should have been in? Yeah, tell us about them. Or if you agree with any of our characters, let us know why. Right. Sweet. That'll be it for this episode of Black Nerd Talk. And we'll catch you again in two weeks. No Total Recall. Bye.